Section 11.4, phase changes. Water left uncovered in a glass for several days evaporates. An ice cube left in a warm room quickly melts. Solid carbon dioxide sold as dry ice sublimes at room temperature. That is, it changes directly from the solid to the vapor state. In general, each state of matter can change into either of the other two states. Figure 1117 shows the name associated with each of these transformations. These transformations are called either phase changes or changes of state. Figure 1117, phase changes and the names associated with them. These changes indicated by red arrows and names are endothermic, whereas those in green are exothermic. Solid to liquid is melting, liquid to solid is freezing, liquid to gas is vaporization, gas to liquid is condensation, solid to gas is sublimation, gas to solid is deposition. Energy changes accompanying phase changes. Every phase change is accompanied by a change in the energy of the system. In a solid, for example, the molecules or the ions are in more or less fixed positions with respect to one another and closely arranged to minimize the energy of the system. As the temperature of the solid increases, the units of the solid vibrate with about their equilibrium positions with increasingly energetic motion. When the solid melts, the units that are made up of the solid are freed to move with respect to one another, which ordinarily means that their average separation increases. This melting process is called, sometimes somewhat confusingly, fusion. The increased freedom of motion of the molecules or ions comes at a price measured by the heat of fusion, or enthalpy of fusion, denoted as delta H sub fuse. The heat of fusion of ice, for example, is 601 kilojoules per mole. As the temperature of the liquid phase increases, the molecules of the liquid move about with increasing energy. One measure of this increasing energy is the concentration of the gas phase molecules over the liquid increases with temperature. These molecules exert a pressure called the vapor pressure. We'll explore vapor pressure in section 11.5. For now, we just need to understand that the vapor pressure increases with the increasing temperature until it equals the external pressure over the liquid, typically atmospheric pressure. At this point, the liquid boils. The molecules of the liquid move into the gaseous state where they are widely separated. The energy required to cause this transition is called the heat of vaporization, or enthalpy of vaporization, denoted delta H sub vape. For water, the heat of vaporization is 40.7 kilojoules per mole. Figure 1118 shows the comparative values of delta H for fusion and delta H of vaporization for four substances. The heat of vaporization values tend to be larger than the heat of fusion because of the transition from the liquid to the vapor state. The molecules must essentially sever all of their intermolecular attractive interactions, whereas in melting, many of these attractions, attractive interactions remain. Figure 1118, comparing enthalpy changes for fusion and vaporization. Heats of fusion, violet bars, and heats of vaporization, blue bars, for several substances. Notice that the heat of vaporization for a substance is always larger than its heat of fusion. The heat of sublimation is the sum of the heats of vaporization and fusion. The molecules of a solid can be transformed directly into the gaseous state. The enthalpy change required for this transition is called the heat of sublimation, denoted uh, H, delta H sub. For the substances sown in figure 1118, the heat of sublimation is the sum of the heat of fusion and the heat of vaporization. Thus, the heat of sublimation for water is approximately 47 kilojoules per mole. Phase changes of matter show up in important ways in our everyday exper experiences. We use ice cubes to cool our, our liquid drinks. The heat of fusion of the ice cools the liquid in, the ice, uh, with the, in which the ice is immersed. We feel cold when we step out of the swimming pool or a warm shower because the heat of vaporization is drawn from our bodies as the water of vapor evaporates from our skin. Our bodies use the evaporation of water from skin to regulate body temperature, especially when we exercise vigorously in warm weather. A refrigerator also relies on the cooling effect of vaporization. Its mechanism contains an enclosed gas that can be liquefied under pressure. The liquid absorbs heat and it subsequently evaporates, 
thereby cooling the interior of the refrigerator. The vapor is then recycled through a compressor. What happens to the heat absorbed when the liquid refrigerant vaporizes? According to the first law of thermodynamics, the heat absorbed by a liquid in a vaporizing must be released when the reverse process, uh, when the reverse process condensation of the vapor to form liquid occurs. As the refrigerator compresses the vapor to form a liquid, the heat released by the condensation process is dissipated through cooling coils in the back of the refrigerator. Just as the heat of condensation is equal in magnitude to the heat of vaporization and has the opposite sign, so the heat of deposition is exothermic to the same degree that the heat of sublimation is endothermic, and the heat of freezing is exothermic to the same degree as the heat of fusion is endothermic. These relationships, shown in figure 1117, are consequences of the first law of thermodynamics. Heating curves. What happens when we melt an ice cube that's initially at negative 25 Celsius and one atmosphere pressure? The addition of heat causes the temperature of the ice to increase. As long as the temperature is below zero Celsius, the ice cube remains frozen. When the temperature reaches zero Celsius, the ice begins to melt. Because melting is an endothermic process, the heat that we add at zero Celsius is used to convert ice to water. The temperature remains constant until all the ice is melted. Once we reach this point, the further addition of heat causes the temperature of the liquid water to increase. A graph of the temperature of the system versus amount of heat added is called a heating curve. Figure 1119 shows a heating curve for the transformation of ice at negative 25 Celsius to steam at 125 Celsius under a constant pressure of one atmosphere. Heating the ice from negative 25 Celsius to zero Celsius is represented by the line segment AB in figure 1119, while converting the ice at zero to water at zero Celsius is the horizontal segment BC. Additional heat increases the temperature of the water until the temperature reaches 100 degrees Celsius, segment CD. The heat is then used to convert water to steam at the constant pressure of 100 degrees Celsius, segment DE. Once all the water has been converted to steam, the steam is heated to its final temperature of 125 degrees Celsius, segment EF. We can calculate the enthalpy change of the system for each segment of the heating curve. In segments A, B, C, D, E, F, we are heating a single phase from one temperature to another. As we saw in section 5.5, the amount of heat needed to raise the temperature of a substance is given by the product of the specific heat, mass, and temperature change. The greater the specific heat of the substance, the more heat we must add to accomplish the certain temperature increase. Because the specific heat of water is greater than that of ice, the slope of segment CD is less than that of segment AB. We must add more heat to water to achieve a 1 degree Celsius temperature change than is needed to warm the same quantity of ice by 1 uh, degree Celsius. In segments BC and DE, we are converting one phase to another at constant temperature. The temperature remains constant during these phase changes because the added energy is used to, to overcome the attractive forces between molecules rather than to increase their average kinetic energy. For segment BC, which the ice is converted to water, the enthalpy change can be calculated by using the heat of fusion, while the segment DE, we can use the heat of vaporization. In sample exercise 11.4, we can calculate the total enthalpy change for the heating curve in figure 11.19. Cooling a substance has the opposite effect of heating it. Thus, if we start with water vapor and begin to cool it, we might move right to left through the events shown in figure 1119. We could first lower the temperature of the, of the vapor, F to E, then condense it, E to D, and so forth. Sometimes as we remove heat from a liquid, we can temporarily cool it below its freezing point without forming a solid. This phenomenon is called supercooling. Supercooling occurs when heat is removed from a liquid so rapidly that the molecules literally have no time to assume the ordered structure of a solid. A supercooled liquid is unstable. Particles of dust entering a solution or the gentle stirring is often sufficient to cause it to, of the substance to solidify quickly. Critical temperature and pressure. A gas normally liquefies at some point when pressure is applied to it. 
Suppose we have a cylinder with a piston containing water vapor at 100 degrees. If we increase the pressure of the water vapor, liquid water will form when the pressure is a 760 torr. On the other hand, if the temperature is 110 degrees Celsius, the liquid phase does not form until the pressure is 1075 torr. At 374 degrees Celsius, the liquid phase forms only at 1.655 times 10 to the fifth torr, or 217.7 atmospheres. Above this temperature, no amount of pressure will cause a distinct uh, liquid to, uh, phase to form. Instead, a pre as pressure increases, the gas merely becomes steadily more compressed. The highest temperature at which a distinct liquid phase can form is referred to as its critical temperature. The critical pressure is the pressure required to bring about liquefaction of this critical temperature. The critical temperature is its highest temperature at which a liquid can exist. Above the critical temperature, the, non, the motional energies of the molecules are greater than the attractive forces that lead the liquid state, regardless how much substance is compressed to, being, to bring the molecules closer together. The greater the intermolecular forces, the greater the critical temperature of the substance. The critical temperature and pressure are listed for several substances in, fig, in Table 11.5. 11, Notice that nonpolar, low molecular weight substances, which have weak intermolecular attractions, have lower critical temperature pressure, uh, temperatures and pressures than those of polar and higher, higher molecular weight. Notice also that water and ammonia have exceptionally high critical temperatures and pressures as a consequence of strong intermolecular uh, hydrogen bonding forces. The critical temperatures and pressures of substances are often considerable importance to engineer and people working with gases because they provide information about the con conditions under which gases liquefy. Sometimes we want to liquefy a gas, other times we want to avoid liquefying it. It's useless to try to liquefy a gas by applying pressure if the gas is above its critical temperature. For example, oxygen has a critical temperature of 154.4 Kelvin. It must be cooled below this temperature before it can be liquefied by pressure. In contrast, ammonia has a critical pressure of 405.6 Kelvin. Thus, it can be liquefied at room temperature, approximately 295 Kelvin, by compressing the gas to a sufficient pressure.